There we go. Powered point at them, but it's, uh, it's kind of cool. From, from a purely functional standpoint, so not the high art of uh, you know airhead shipping, but same principle, slightly different result. What are you working on there? This is called a blade core or flake core, and uh, this, is, this is a single platform core. It has a, a single flat surface or flattish surface from which. I'm removing flakes all the way around. This is not uh, uh, goal-oriented in that there is some plan to extract from the middle of this you know, uh, a formal airhead or point, but this is just making utility tools. You know, the sharp flake is, uh, is your best tool, and a flake core like this is designed <clears throat> so that you can work around the upper surface and remove flakes around the perimeter. So I these flakes to be used to do all kinds of stuff. So the flake itself is a different creature than a finished point. That has a serrated edge, which is more like a steak knife. But, uh, you know, it's an okay knife for some things, but it doesn't have this sort of clean, cutting edge that a modern pocket knife would have. And the flake that you can create doing this. I'm trying not to cut myself by holding the sharp edge there, but the flake itself has a more conventional knife-like edge that can be used you know, as a sharp knife, razor blade, if you will, something like that. And the ability to make flakes, special, you know, good predictable flakes that are long and narrow, that have a good cutting edge from a, from a core, is a different process than the chipping of uh, uh, you know, formal projectile points and arrowheads, what we call bifaces. This is a, uh, you know, the, the geometry is the same for all of them, but the technique for removing these things is slightly different than producing a bifacial tool such as a you know, knife blade or projectile point like that. And if you're out in the woods and you want to make tools to survive with, the uh, ability to produce flake blades from a core like this is much more important, in my estimation, than being able to produce uh, bifacial tools such as arrowheads and projectile points. You can do everything with a good flake blade that you can do with a, an arrowhead, except put it on the end of a stick and go stab something. Right. And if you can make these, then you can, you know, with a little bit of work and a little ingenuity and uh, some skill, practice and all that, you can turn these into, you know, especially a thicker piece. Here's some from this uh, core from yesterday, from the, the early stages of removal for this, though, you know, from much bigger. You, know, you can see that you could make a, a projectile point or airhead from that. There's enough, uh, enough mass, enough thickness left there so that uh, you could actually get that out of there. You know, in the meantime, you might use that as a knife, but at some other point, you may opt to, to shape it. What, I did, I said, what kind of material are you using? This is the local Flint River <laughs> material. Oh, is it? You know, it? It is the Flint River. Yeah. Right. And uh, people sometimes are surprised that uh, you know, I'm sitting here chipping, so, chipping stone, and they say, well, where did that come from? I go, well, it came from right over here because we were on the Flint River. And, uh, uh, oh, so that actually came from out here? Yeah, this, uh, well, some of it did. Uh, this piece came from over there, you know, just like literally you know, 50 yards over there. And it was part of a much larger piece of stone that contained a uh, great deal of limestone, or very limey uh, parent rock here for it. But I can see the, the little bit of good stuff on the inside. And uh, I battered apart a large piece of this sort of soft, sandy, chalky stuff to get the goodie out, which uh, conveniently just sort of rolled out of the bigger piece. Yeah, that would pull you to look at it, wouldn't it? Yeah, I struck a, I could see a little corner of it sticking out, and so I needed some goodie in there. I wasn't sure how big it was, but it was a nice piece, and I planned on busting it up and making uh, tools out of it. But I got the piece out. I knocked off the flake that ended up a, a curved fracture called a hinge fracture, and uh, I took that piece and left the hinge fracture on the bottom right there. It's smooth from the rollout where it popped out of the parent core. 
I made a little point, stuck it back in there, and just showed how the how the, the point emerges from the stone itself. And uh, you know, I was packing up to come down here on Thursday, and uh, I live up in the northern half of the state, up in near Athens. And I thought, you know, I could bring some stone with me, or I could just wait till I get down to the Flint River. Find the local and stuff. Just get the local because I know it's here. I've collected rock down here for you know. 25 years or more. So, You're an archaeologist, right? I am, yeah. A lot of what I do is, is oriented towards public education and things like this. And uh, um, also, you know, this borders on experimental work as well. There's, uh, there's an element of this that you can write hit on this thing. Um, that was a nice flake. Got it. Yeah, you know, this is you know about public education, and it's also about uh, you know experimentation because if you find tools, you know, you find flakes, you know, not everything's about you know chipping, you know, recognizable formal arrowheads or projectile points. And I'd say projectile point just to kind of you know differentiate the fact that a lot of these are not only means of arrows shot with bows or other kinds of projectiles that use similar kind of tips. Yeah, it would take a lot of work to put all that in together into a bow and arrow. I it imagine. does, and even a, even an atlatl or spear thrower is still you know we find a you know a, a a projectile tip, and that is literally the tip of the iceberg. You know, it's like that's one of those things that you know we you know, we see that. I think that's the important part. But then you realize that all these things have something else attached to them somehow. You know, they're they're part of weapons and weapon systems, or or you know, subsistence strategies and that sort of thing as well. But well, I think what a lot of people find and call arrowheads are actually more like cutting tools and spare points. Yeah, in a lot of cases they're knives. I mean, you can you know you can see here a couple of just you know what I laid out today just for fun. You know, these are knives. You have to have cutting tools. Um, a lot of these things that we call arrowheads are a little too big to actually be an effective arrowhead on the end of an arrow that you would shoot with a bow. And uh, a little arithmetic is sometimes in order here that when we talk about uh, Indians in America, we know that people have been here in this part of the world for around 12,000 years, at least 12,000 years. There's a there's a growing body of evidence that there were people here prior to 12,000 years ago, which is going to kind of, it, it sort of rocks a lot of archaeologists' worlds to have to think about that. But nonetheless, we know that for around 12,000 years there have been people here. And we also have a pretty good idea that somewhere around 2,000 years ago was when the bow was invented. And uh, uh, that leaves us 10,000 years where there were lots of Indians and no bows and arrows. And the weapon that was used during the majority of that, that very long time period uh, is a weapon called the spear thrower or atalat. And they can be fancier. I didn't want to get the fancier ones out in the rain today, so I brought a single one-piece item here. This is the spear thrower or atalat. It's a stick with a hook. Uh, this one has the hook carved into it, although you can carve them out of antler and put them together as composite weapons like that. This is a very uh, typical kind of way. But the hook fits into a hole, a knock point in the end of a spear so that you can engage and this is similar to and in fact uh, you know atlatls are you know they're, they're sort of the beginning of archery right here uh, similar to the knock point of an arrow as it, as it engages the string of a bow and you throw this thing uh, effectively making your arm about twice as long as it naturally is and you can throw like that and uh, get a lot more power and distance than you can with your bare hand but a lot of things we call arrowheads and the reason projectile point is a much better term is because you know this is not an arrow so it's not an arrowhead uh, we call these projectile points because depending on you know what you're talking about you can always be sort of correct you know it's, it's sort of a, a, an all-purpose term but a lot of the projectile points would have been on removable four shafts that fit into the reinforced end of uh, you know, here in the southeast probably a piece of river cake you know the material of choice but you know you can use hardwoods and, uh, well it wouldn't be practical to carry a dozen of those would it yeah you know even if you had a dozen of them you might have you know two or three dozen of these right right here so that you can replace tips you carry a handful of spears just like you carry a quiver full of arrows but in the meantime you know because you can remove the tip off this thing if you make a point and you tie it firmly on a six foot long stick you can only do a limited range of stuff with it it only functions so many ways but by being able to remove it you can maintain it you can replace broken stuff but you can also take these and use them as knives uh, you can cut with them, you can gouge, drill, you know, use them any number of other uh, uh, paths that if you tied it firmly on here, you would be unable to do. It. So that's a, that's a neat little bit of history, you know, when we're, when we're talking about prehistory in this part of the world, you know, people sometimes have never heard of or seen an avalanche of a spear thrower, but uh, you know, again, in, in terms of time, you know, yeah. good morning. How you doing? Good. And in, in terms of the, uh, uh, in the time frame we're looking at, the bow is a relatively recent invention.
that was in there a very long period of time from the end of the Ice Age up to around 2,000 years ago when, uh, you know, there were no bows and arrows, there were a lot of Indians. And right. this is a weapon that they were using. And most of the points we find in a lot of areas are some version of knife blade, addle addle dart tips, you know, right. that sort of thing as well. You think the uh, bow was an import from Asia? I don't think so. You know, so many people around the world uh, understood and knew, knew about the bow independently of everybody else that I don't I don't think it had to come from anywhere else. Uh, I think there are, are practical and dynamic uh, parts of this that uh, that people had to already understand. You know, that you know, it's like firing clay. You know, at some yeah. point you understand clay gets harder than you fire. It's like Michael is gonna make a pottery. But there's there's a point of practicality to it where if you're a hunter gather, most of that ten thousand year period uh, people were hunting and gathering and not only in one place, so you don't want to have a bunch of clay pots. You may know full well that clay gets hard when you fire, but it's a big fragile thing. It might be difficult to hear it right. So you just continue to cook in hide bags or, or wooden cloths or hot rocks and, uh, well, and, and baskets, baskets and everything else. They right. figured it else out. You cook like that. Uh, and I think the bow is the same. The bow can function as a musical instrument, a simple machine, you know, for you know, making fire, drilling holes and stuff. But at some point, you know, the hunter gatherer, you know, if you're traveling around in a tent in this kind of weather, feel free to step in the, uh, the uh, thing and get out of the oh, okay. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm just going to try to keep the camera dry. Uh, I see that. But, but, you know, it's like you may know you may know about a bow. And, in fact, like I said, you know, atlatls, there's, uh, you know, part of atlatl technology is that atlatls can be and often probably more flexible weapons. So, you know, again, back to that analogy of archery, you know, that's half of the bow right, right. there. You know, if you make an atlatl twice as long... Well, that would probably give you a little more flinging power, too. It does. It's a definite improvement of rigid atlatl. Right. You know, just like, uh, you know, certain kinds of guns, you know, a single-barrel shotgun will kill a deer just as effectively as a machine gun. You know, right. At some point, you only need so much. You know, the thing, the thing will function as needed, you know, right. at a real simple level, but you can make it fancier. And again, you know, an atlatl twice as long, you can't aim it, but if you tie it together with a string, uh, you can aim that much better. And I think that when people begin to practice agriculture, uh, live in one place, you, you begin to have both the ability and the necessity for producing a functional bow. You have living in one permanent location uh, with the structure, you know, you put the bow safe in the raft in your house, keep it dry. You know, if you're a hunter-gatherer roaming around this stuff, you know, it'd be a, a tall order to try to, you know, maintain bow making equipment. You know, Adelaide will make equipment, not so bad. You know, on a sunny day, you make a new Adelaide and you're done. You work know. with what you got. Yeah, work with what you got. But, you know, someday you're farming, you know, you plant little corn, and, uh, you know, first off, you're living in one place so you physically can do it. And the other thing is you start thinking about you know, how you hunt, well, you know, garden and farm, we'll find out very quickly something else will feed your food before you do. Right. And as a former hunter-gatherer, you may realize that in planting food, that you you simplified your life because the game now come, are now coming to you. But you can't ambush very easily with an atlatl. It's not a really good ambush weapon, but you go, this thing, you know, this is a much sneakier weapon with a higher rate of fire. So I think we should look at it in terms of uh, kind of a, a, a effective necessity, uh, possibility dynamic that it works much better that way. I'm going to stop right there. Okay.